please rise. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. It is with this assurance of hope that we come here today to worship our God and to give thanks for the life of Walter Shorty Sims, a beloved son, brother, uncle, friend. He is a man who lived the life given him by God, sharing God's gifts and God's love with his family and indeed his brothers and sisters in Christ and his entire community, as well as generations of Hamden Sydney men. With his kind, open ways, he taught us so much more than we ever knew and left, left us all a great path to follow. It is in that same spirit that we come to celebrate, to give thanks, and to bear witness to the perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Blessed and holy God, we thank you for all of your saints who have kept the faith, finished their race, and who rest from their labor. We thank you this day for the opportunity to gather in fellowship and worship for the opportunity to praise your holy name and to gather as a community of faith to give you thanks and be consoled in this difficult time. Especially we come today thanking you for Walter, a beloved member of our family of faith and your own child whom you have now received into your presence, who taught so much more with his life than we could possibly learn in the very short time that we have had together. This day, we come asking for minds to remember all that he has taught us. Help us, Lord, to understand, even as we struggle with this separation. Help us to believe where we have not seen. Trusting you to lead us through our years. Bring us at last with Walter and all of our, your saints into the joy of your home. We come asking this through and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We now have words of welcome from the chairman of the Board of Trustees here at Hamden Sydney College, Peebles Harrison. So a few weeks ago, I was talking with Larry and I asked him when this service was going to be scheduled. And he told me it was this day, but it was still tentative. Um, Larry and I talk once a week and as the following week, he said, well, it is set for the 23rd. And he shared with me that he had a longstanding commitment to take Connor to see colleges up in the Northeast. And I said, well, Larry, why don't you go ahead and do that, and I'll stand in for you. And he agonized over this because he really wanted to be here, and he felt it was important to be here. And I would go back and say, but Larry, you've got this family obligation. You've really been doing a lot of work. Take care of this. And as this went back and forth, I started to get nervous because I thought, Larry's going to make me tell him the cold, hard truth. Walter expects nothing less than the chairman of the board to represent the college at this service. <laughs> Gordon tells me that the college Facebook site posted 130,000 hits when news of Walter's passing broke. As a point of reference, General Wilson's announcement received 30,000 hits. And General Wilson right now is smiling about that fact. 
Um, you couldn't have two guys that, in many ways, were on very different ends of the spectrum. Yet both of them, in their own way, were extraordinarily impactful for us on this campus and the students who came through here. And Walter in ways that General Sam just simply could not. Now, I was a student here in the late 80s. I didn't play sports, but I got to know Walter. And two things always stood out uh, to me about Walter and my interactions with him. One was his strident insistence that he belonged in the group with us. No one was going to interfere with that. And his, his condition was not going to interfere with it, nor were you. He was one of us. The second thing that always stood out for me was despite all the obstacles he faced, he played his hand as well as anyone could. He led a purpose, purposeful life. He did it his way. And watching him be around us, it taught us many different lessons about how to lead a pur purposeful life and how to deal with adversity in life. And these were lessons that stayed with me to this day and with many of us who have graduated. Now I'm going to end because while Walter would have expected me to be here, he would have had little patience for the chairman's speech making. This day is about Walter. It's a celebration. I can't wait to hear more stories. And I do want to close with one point to Walter's family. Um, I think it was Scott, it was a reference in the Richmond paper that uh, the family felt that they were blessed to have had Walter, raise Walter here and have him in this community. And I just think that it was the other way around, that we were extraordinarily blessed as students and as a community to have Walter for 40 years. Thank you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we bless you that in your inspired written word are hidden the treasures of wisdom and knowledge preserved by your grace through ages past. Now open our ears to hear anew these scriptural words that have embraced all of us when our feet have stumbled and our flesh has failed. And in the reality of Jesus Christ, your eternal word was made flesh, also promising life eternal for all of your children. So now open our hearts to receive anew that hope. In your name, amen. The words are familiar ones. We have thought about them. We have said them, we have felt them, listen to them again, as God's word, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not have any more, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures, he leadeth me beside the still waters, he restored my soul, he leadeth me in the paths of righteousness, for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joe Sheridan. And I'm sure most of you have no idea who I am, but Today's Walter's Day, and uh, he's sitting next to St. Peter saying, uh, make the sunshine on Hampton, Sydney today. Lower the humidity. And he, he certainly did. Like many of you, I was blessed to share and to nurture a wonderful relationship with Shorty for nearly 25 years. And I'm honored to be here at Hampton, Sydney to celebrate the life and times of this wonderful man. Hampton, Sydney, I found, was an extraordinary place. And every time I was here to watch my son, Brian, 
and his teammates play basketball for Coach Shaver's classy and captivating program. And even after games, sitting with Walter in the student center, talking about rock and roll legends and his beloved Washington Redskins. I always hated to leave. It was decades ago that these historic surroundings welcomed Walter and the Sims family. And it was Hampton, Sydney, right here at Hampton, Sydney, that provided the setting for Walter to humbly pursue his doctorate in unconditional kindness. It was right here at Hampton, Sydney, where generations of students, athletes, faculty, and friends, and visitors alike, many of you here I know are here today, that treasure your own special memories of Hampton, Sydney's number one fan. By the way, I'll bet Coach Shaver and Coach Bush and Coach Favre and Coach Stokely, I'm sure that they feel that Shorty's presence on the sideline and on the bench probably provided a few victories for Hampton, Sydney. He cheered wildly at every, at every touchdown and every, every basket scored. And when the band played on, between periods or halftime, Walter introduced dance routines that even Michael Jackson would probably take notice of. You see, Walter, in my experience with Walter, he didn't have a defect. He had a God-given gift. And he was living proof that those who are perceived afflicted with downs can achieve, can prosper. And I wonder who among us here today, all of us, can honestly say that we, in our own lives, influenced, inspired, or positively affected more lives than Walter Sims. A famous philosopher once said, when the flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment within which it grows, not the flower. Well, see, Walter didn't need fixing. Because of Hampton, Sydney, and especially a heaven-sent brother in Scott Sims, together, they enabled Walter, and they provided Walter with the environment and he became the most beautiful flower in the garden for 70 years, the most brilliant flower in the garden. To you, Scott Sims, it was the Hollies, one of Walter's famous favorite, excuse me, one of his favorite bands who in 1969, they recorded the hit song, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. And the lyrics continued, so we go on. His welfare is my concern. No burden is he to bear. Well, those lyrics, Scott, I think were written with men like you in mind. And I don't think any brother, anywhere, ever, did a better job than you. And I think all of us here today, and of course Walter, say thank you. And to you, Miss Scott, a matriarch who kept it all together, thank you. As our friendship grew, I began to realize that there was really no one in this world other than Walter that I had such a special relationship and a profound connection it was important to have a connection with Walter. And you had to do it on his terms, by the way. And because most of us are bombarded by social media, technology, and life's ridiculously rapid pace, we forget sometimes or we dismiss 
the opportunity to enjoy quiet, patient, incredible, incredibly tranquil times with our own loved ones. And that's what it was all about with Walter. And it was with Walter on many occasions that I shared that soothing peace. He opened my eyes. And his absolute kindness and remarkable sense of humor made me keenly aware that Shorty was probably more normal than most of us. He was a mentor. He was a mentor of the greatest magnitude. And I know that he gave me, and probably some of you, far more enjoyment, far more than I could possibly ever give him. I'd like to share just a couple of those special moments that Shorty and I shared. It was early in 73, nearly 45 years ago, when Walter's family left Charleston, West Virginia. Walter's dad began a nice, long, and fruitful career right here in the Hampton Sydney Athletic Department. Walter was just 24 years old. Nearly 30 years had passed since Walter left his childhood home and roots in Charleston, West Virginia. And it was in 2001, Waldo and I planned a trip to his bucket list dream of visiting the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We decided to drive to Canton, Ohio. And it took us right through Charleston, West Virginia. As we approached Charleston, Shorty turned off his ever-present cassette tapes listening to Elvis and everybody else. And he looked over at me. And he pointed to a roadway exit sign and he said, Hey, bud, get off right there. I smiled and I said, Walter, we just ate. You can't still be hungry. <laughs> he said, no, bud. I said, you get off right here. I did as Shorty directed. I exited off the ramp and proceeded closely to follow Walter's navigation requests. We passed several uh, traffic lights and we made several turns winding through the streets of Charleston, West Virginia. And several minutes later, we were miles from the exit that Walter told me to get off on. And we were driving down a quiet lined Charleston street. And Walter said to me, pull into that driveway. I did as he asked. And he looked at me and he held his hands close together as he always did when he was elated, full of joy. And he said, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about, Walter? He looked, Walter looked up at me in the car and with a tear in his eye, he said, hey, bud, that's my home. That's where my mom and dad and my brother Scott, that's where we lived. For a moment, I just sat there stunned. Walter got out of the car and onto the front lawn of the home that he grew up in. And an elderly, excuse me, an elderly lady approached him with tears in her own eyes. Her name was Mrs. Rollins. And she said, Oh my gosh, Walter, is that you? The neighbor, uh, Mrs. Rollins, 30 years had passed since they'd seen one another. And as I observed their warm embrace and their very brief conversation, I realized that once again, with Walter, I was witnessing the essence of life's fondest moments. It was unbelievable. Shorty didn't have a Garmin. He didn't have a phone. No MapQuest. 
no road map, no directions. Yet this brilliant man, all by himself, three years removed, found once again his childhood home and the magnificent memories of his cherished mother and father. It was a special time. Well, from there it was off to the Hall of Fame where Walter saw and confirmed, he needed to confirm that his hero, Sonny Jurgensen, was indeed enshrined. He wanted to make sure. As we walked through the memorial, Walter said to me, he said, you remember Gail Sayers? I said, sure, everybody knows Gail Sayers. Walter says, well, he ought to be here. I said, Walter, he is. He said to me then, what about Joe Namath, Fran Tarkenton? I said, Walter, they're all here. The names and the memories went on and on. And we had a spectacular time for four hours in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Coming home from the Hall of Fame that day, together we laughed. No phones, remember. No Facebook interruptions. We just laughed and talked about everything and about nothing. Walter said, you think there's a Bob Evans down on the farm close by? <laughs> he would eat nowhere else. Had to have Bob Evans down on the farm. After we ate, we turned back on his cassette player, and uh, I listened to Walter in his own way, in his own rendition, sing every rock and roll song that ever existed. Finally, we returned, we returned back to Walter's world right here in good old Hampton, Sydney. Less than a year later, it was off to Cleveland and Walter's number one bucket list destination. I got to see the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. On this trip, we decided to fly and Scott and I, we called ahead to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we found the curator. Her name was Emily Purcell. And Miss Purcell, we told Miss Purcell about Walter's extraordinary passion and knowledge of 50 years of rock and roll music. And we also told her we're on the way. <laughs> and that Walter was overwhelmed with excitement to see the shrine where his heroes dwelt. He said, Joe, try to get here early. Say 8.30. I made sure we did arrive early. Then I quickly found out why. You see, Emily opened the famous museum two hours early, and only for Walter. Unencumbered by crowds, not a single person in sight for two hours. On his own private tour, Walter saw his legends perform. He chatted and sang along with Elvis, Ray Charles, Sam Cooke, Buddy Holly, his favorite, Jerry Lee Lewis and dozens more. I've seen Walter happy many times in my life but I never saw him happier than that day at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Coming home on Delta Airlines, Walter cozied up next to me at the ticket counter as we were picking up our coach boarding passes. And the agent noticed Walter's t-shirt, the Hall of Fame t-shirt that he was wearing. And she engaged Shorty in a brief conversation about his experience at the Hall of Fame. She then discreetly asked Walter, have you ever flown first class? Walter, glancing up at me with that wry smile he always had when something good was gonna happen. <laughs> and then back at the woman, with his customary expression of joy, he pointed his finger at the young lady and he said, now you're talking. <laughs> Yeah.
the agent handed Walter the tickets. They were first class. Walter and I sat side by side in row 1C and 1D. We drank Coke, pret ate pretzels, potato chips, cookies, everything Walter, and they just kept on coming. <laughs> Shorty and I flew home, flew home first class, and I can assure you that I had absolutely nothing to do with it. There's many more experiences that I've shared with Walter, and from each of them I've come away affirming that if we could all just together harness and utilize the kindness, the decency, the integrity, the humility, the gentleness, and the passion that Walter uh, displayed every day of his life. I believe our nation would heal. I believe our nation would unite. You see, this simple, kind man, if you just listened, he had all the answers. I'd like to conclude with this thought. I spent four great years watching Coach Shaver's basketball program outclass most of their opponents. I watched my son with pride, Brian, and his loyal, well-coached teammates wear the maroon and white with style and distinction. For decades, it was you young men on the football gridiron and on the basketball court that brought Walter to his feet in thunderous applause. Year after year, decade after decade, it was you young men who played football and basketball and every other sport right here at Hampton, Sydney, that contributed to the incredible wellness of Walter's life. All those years he cheered, and he cheered for you young men at Hampton, Sydney, where men are men and women are welcomed guests. I have never seen this campus without more women than there were men. All those years he enriched Hampton, Sydney College with passion and with a style that I know is impossible to duplicate. His spirit and his legend will always grace these hallowed and historic grounds. And every young man in the future, fortunate enough to mat matriculate here at Hampson Sydney, should learn the lore of this man called Shorty. He should find a purpose and make a difference in someone or something other than himself. And if you do that, you will find the tranquil peace that enriched Walter Sims for 70 years. Driving here today from Richmond, I realize that at this moment right now, it's unlikely that we will ever be together again real soon. And I just wondered if together, and even those that may be streaming this celebration for Walter Sims. Like, like Shorty did for you athletes for so many years. I wonder if we could all rise together and give Walter our own version of a thunderous applause. We'll see you again, Walter. Thank you very much. Tough act to follow. Um, <laughs> it's a cheap way to get an ovation there, too. Uh, there. <laughs> Scott and Scott, thank you. Uh, I'm honored to be here today. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out um, 
uh, Lucy and Jay Fulton being here, and and my man Lou Wacker, the winningest coach in ODAC history, um, the legend being here as well. I'm humbled by your presence, Coach, and uh, let's hear it for Coach Wacker. It's great to have you back, buddy. So I get hired back in January of 2000, and um, and Joe Bush had kind of given me the short Walter Sims story, but um, I'm in the office and I'm, I'm making some calls and trying to become a head coach and figure all it out, and, and I see this guy pacing outside in the hallway, and I made another call and he's still out there pacing, and finally I meet Walter for the first time, and. I remember like it was yesterday because he came in, introduced himself, told me about Bob Thalman, told me about Stokely, told me about Joe Bush, gave me the history, told me I was his best guy, gave me a big hug. And then right as I was getting, he was getting ready to leave, he pointed in my chest and he said, you're my guy, but you're never going to beat Lou Wacker and Henry and Henry ever. And I, <laughs> I was like... Tough crowd here, man. He's, he's crushing me, and, and, and he was right. It took some time, but uh, he was always blunt that way. Um, you know, as, as a lot of you know, for years and years, Shorty always wore the jersey uh, of the year. So you could look at an old picture, and he's wearing 87. You know, it's 1987. And 92, 93, 94, and they'd always give him a jersey with the, with the year. Well... I got hired in 2000, so I had a little kind of an issue, like, what am I going to do? So I'm trying to get ready for the Swanee game, but literally in our staff meeting, are like, do we go with double zero? You know, what's the number we're going to give them? So sure enough, we went down to Parrots, Sims on the back, we went with double zero, and um, gave it to him at the hitching post, and he threw it right back in my face. <laughs> <laughs> he was not Y2K compatible. Um, so starting that year, he started wearing the jersey of his, his actual age. So we gave him a 53. I see Scott's over there wearing a 56 from the movie. And that's how he trended onward. And, uh, you know, the son of a gun made it to 70. And um, Scott, Scott, like you guys, come up. We got a little jersey to give you. I'll be brief. I just got a couple other things to address. Um, we always talked about his incredible spirit. And, you know, if you look up spirit in the dictionary, there's like 19 different definitions. You know, what is spirit? So I did that this morning. I got out an old school dictionary, and, um, and this is what jumped out at me, one of the many different spirit definitions. An attitude or principle that inspires thought, feeling, or action. And with that in mind, I want to share a letter I got 14 years ago after the movie came out. Um, Dear Coach, I'm a fifth grade teacher at an elementary school in Mobile, Alabama. This past Friday, I showed my kids the Shorty movie. I was hoping you could convey to Walter the wonderful impact his story had on my kids. By the end of the documentary, they were cheering for the Tigers like it was the Super Bowl. I've now had three parents ask for a copy of the movie. I wanted you to know that many hours away, Shorty's present is very much felt. Good luck to you and your team. Sincerely, Cecilia Becker, fifth grade teacher, Newman High School. So his spirit, not only is it in this room, but it's as far away as Mobile, Alabama. And per that movie, the, my, the most poignant part of that movie for me was when Shorty, after Brad had passed away, and we were up in Gettysburg, he looked up in the sky and he said, I'm talking to you, God. Well, I'm talking to you, Shorty. 
thank you for all you did for me and my team. And we'll do our best to beat Henry and Henry next month. Okay, buddy? <laughs> you my guy. Thank you. My name is Michael Furno, and I am the uh, director of the movie Shorty. Um, you know, I haven't really had the chance to properly grieve Shorty, so it's going to be a little bit difficult for me because to see everybody and to be back here, it's such a special place, you know? And Shorty, uh, while being the flower that grew in the garden, good flowers don't grow without good soil. And this community and his family, ah, uh, man, you know, I got married here by this guy. <laughs> I mean, I'm from New Jersey, you know what I mean? Like. My kid took his first steps in the, in the Sims household. It, it, I'm grateful to stand before you today and honor an unlikely legend. It's well documented that Shorty was Hamden Sidney's super fan, but I'll tell you in no uncertain terms, he was a superstar. And I know that sounds like hyperbole, especially coming from somebody like me, but he was the leading man and titular character in an award-winning internationally distributed feature film. His image was broadcast on the Jumbotron in Times Square, New York City. He's been celebrated in sold out venues from New York to Los Angeles. Movie stars and dignitaries sought his company. His story is available in over 3,000 schools across the United States. He's had songs written about him. His name has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars for a number of charities and foundations, and he transcended and des his designated station in life to have an impact that reached far and wide and spanned over decades and will be remembered by generations. And he accomplished all that just by being Shorty, the superstar. You know, for a guy who rarely left Hamden, Sydney, he sure had life figured out. There was something magical about him. I mean, yes, he made everybody better, we know that, but it was how he made it that made him special. He had the ability to slow time and to make you engage and be present. He was a pure spirit that provided light that would not only fill you with warmth, but if you were open to it, could really bless you with a moment of peace. Of course, he wasn't perfect, but he was perfectly human. I feel especially privileged to have been his biographer because I got to experience him first as a storyteller and then as his friend. And I never stop marveling at Shorty. I never stop learning from him because the older I get, the more I realize just how amazing his life was and how special the opportunity was to be a part of it. Without getting into too much detail, who I am today is a direct result of knowing Walter Sims, his family, and this community. He saved me in many ways because it wasn't too long ago I was a struggling filmmaker drowning in a sea of compromise. And meeting Shorty truly, uh, truly altered my destiny and fundamentally changed me as a person. Because he provided me with the seeds to grow my center that helped create a gravity that attracted so many good things to my life. And for this, I will be forever grateful to Shorty, to the Sims family, and of course to Hamden Sidney. That's the number one lesson I learned from Shorty, was to be grateful. And while I'll never be able to repay the opportunities that the experience that Shorty has provided, I will do my best to honor his memory by embodying the spirit and living by his example. Shorty gave us a new way to see the world. He gave us unconditional love. He was happy when we were happy. He was there for us without judgment when we were lost. He taught us to be family, to those who needed it, to be kind, to be generous, to open our home, to share in our wisdom, to inspire laughter, to create light, to live in the moment, to show what it means to truly love, and above all, to be grateful. So thank you, Shorty. I am forever grateful to be able to stand before you and honor the unlikely legend. Thank you. A reading from the Gospel of Luke. 
But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The, woman, the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the man said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This passage of Scripture is, I hope, very familiar. I really do hope you've heard it before. I know Shorty heard it because he came to church exactly twice a year on Christmas and Easter. And he would always respond to the family's request if he was going to church on that Sunday, he would say, it's not Christmas, it's not Easter. And that was the answer to that question. It is the story of Easter morning as told in Luke, or at least part of the story. It tells an amazingly, in an amazingly brief way what has transpired that morning when everything we thought we knew changed. The disciples of Christ, the apostles, and the other followers were reeling, probably hiding out in fear that they too would be turned over and arrested and perhaps killed. But these three women went to do what needed to be done, what couldn't be done on Friday before sunset. They went to anoint Jesus' body with spices. More than just a practical thing that was done to keep the odors down from a body that was degenerating and decaying, it was more of a ritualistic thing, a way to say farewell, goodbye, remember some of the good things of that person. In this case, they were remembering someone who had changed their lives. However, when they got there, they got the biggest shock perhaps they had ever had. There was no body, and I don't mean nobody, I mean there was not a body in the tomb. We can only imagine the thoughts that immediately started running through their heads. The writer of Luke says only they were perplexed about this understatement, to say the least, I would think. Then they received another shock. These two men in dazzling clothes stood before them, and the implication is clear. These are divine messengers. And the woman received not a fact-filled explanation, but rather a question. Why do you look for the living? among the dead. He is not dead, but he has risen. And then they are told something that is very key. Remember. Remember what he told you would happen. Remember the stated. Remember what he told you about this particular event but also the implicit in this command to remember. Remember all He said. Remember who He was. Remember all He taught you. Remember how He made you feel. Remember the good, the confusing, and the downright unexplainable. And remembering who Jesus was, what He taught through His actions, His words, just Him being Him, they brought sense and sanity and meaning to a situation that seemed totally senseless, insane, and beyond understanding. I have struggled mightily with what to say to you all this afternoon. For these three weeks, or perhaps even far, farther, it is hard to do a memorial meditation or service for a good friend. And that is what Walter is. Has been to me a good friend. Even perhaps more than that, Walter has been someone who taught me a great deal. And by trying to sort through all of that, it has been a difficult time. So I've had to remember Walter, all that he taught me to make any sense of any of this. Like many of you, I first saw Walter when I came to this campus as an incoming freshman 
That was 40 years and one month ago. I came to campus early for football camp and Walter was probably the third person I met upon arriving. I had heard, fortunately, about Walter from my brother and seen him from afar at a couple of games. But nothing can really prepare anyone for meeting Walter. I remember that it was a bit uneasy. How can I talk to him? How should I deal with him? He was, after all, a bit different. It didn't take long to figure out that I should talk to him pretty much like I talked to everyone else, and that the uneasiness I felt went quickly away. Walter was not one to abide standoffishness or uneasiness. If he sensed either, it was like throwing a red flag in front of a bull. He went right through you. So that was the first lesson that I learned from Walter Sims. While pretense and aloof manners around campus were often the norm, we greet each other with, how are you today? How's it going? And students smile and say, it's fine. And we rarely mean it because we are usually late for wherever it is that we're going, and we really don't want to talk about how we feel. But with Walter, everything was real. Walter's style was to come up, not ask you how you were doing, but put a bear hug on you that would pull the breath right out of your lungs. If you weren't prepared for that hug, you could be gasping for breath. Personal space was not a concept Walter bought into much. Especially if he thought you were standoffish. It was like now you were fresh meat. (laughs) The first thing I learned from Walter There were no pretenses in his relationships. If he was angry with you, you knew it. If he was happy with you, you knew it. If he was sad or confused or just having a bad day, you knew it. To an introverted kid who grew up in rural North Carolina, I found it both disturbing and comforting to know everything about him. Often in this place that I did not feel that I totally belonged sometimes, I always knew where I stood with Walter. Thankfully, most of the time, I was within his good graces. You did not want to be on his bad list at all. My original discomfort changed to more of a big brother watchfulness, which is probably what most people that come to school here remember. It was a playful relationship, one in which we poked fun at each other, you would kid him, I learned what over 40 years of Hamden Sydney men learned. Walter was our little brother. We would tease him and try to trip him up on records and what year they came out or change the title a little bit and argue with him that he just loved giving it as good as he got it. Hours in locker rooms and around campus, we would play with him and give him a hard time because he was indeed family. He met regularly with the committee. Those people on a Friday afternoon, the, the, this, the committee over here, pointing you out, you guys are in it. And they would do exactly the same thing that I had done many years earlier. The same thing that Hamden City men were doing with Walter forever. What I didn't really grasp until I returned here a little over a year ago is how much of my Hamden Sydney experience was tied to Walter. Walter is for me, as he is for all of those who experienced Hamden Sydney during their tenure tenure here, an integral part of going to college. The whole experience of Hamden Sydney College. As much as the bricks, the mortar, the playing fields, the classrooms, faculty, staff, and yes, coach, even coaches, and administration. Walter was key to what I learned on this campus. While I had been feeling this this whole past year, I could never really figure out why until these past three weeks. I couldn't figure out why when I would see a student riding a bike on campus, I would always, by reflex, reflex, look at to see if that was Walter. I knew it wasn't, logically, but that's how I had experienced him for four years 
and I was always looking to see where he was, my little brother. He taught us so much, not because he was just around, not because he was such a character with many eccentricities, and we all know stories. Walter did have those things. Meatloaf on Thursday, not on Friday, just on Thursday. Bumming quarters from the post office staff when it was in Graham Hall so that he could put 50 cents into the drink machine. He loved his afternoon Coca-Cola. But then he got worried that perhaps he would run out, the machine might run out, so he bummed a lot of quarters, started storing it up in the refrigerator that they had to the point where the refrigerator was so full they couldn't put their lunches in it anymore. It's not that upon being presented with a brand new bike by the Hamden Sydney basketball team, which had raised the money to get him a new bike, that Walter did what Walter does. He said, I, I don't like it. It's blue. <laughs> That's Walter. No, the reason he is such a part of the experience for all of the men who have come through these gates is because all of the things he did as lovingly as possible. Even when he was angry, he never meant to hurt someone. There was never any evil intent in him at all. He had the innocence of a child and thus loved completely and accepted us as students completely. And he just assumed that we would accept him completely and love him completely right back. And damn it, we did. I don't know how he did that. I still don't know how, but it works. Perhaps we should all give that a shot. Walter Sims taught me more than 40 years of me more and more of the other people who have come through these gates. 40 years of Hamden, Sydney men, how to love fully, laugh wholeheartedly, and enjoy life to its fullest. He helped us to see that what is the most in this community, this homogenous environment around, that we could love and be loved by someone completely different from us in so many ways. And what we need to remember, as did those ladies at the tomb, is the way to love as Walter loved us. Brothers and sisters, I beg you to not make the mistake of looking for Walter among the dead. Look for him in the lives of Hamden Sydney men, their families, Look for Walter in the action of those whom he loved and taught, those who loved him and learned from him. On Thursday, the 31st of August, after having been blessed to be at his bedside while he breathed his laugh, I drove back down back Hamden Sydney Road coming to campus, a road I cannot even begin to tell you how many times I've been on. And I was trying desperately to digest all of this stuff that had been in my mind for so long. Figure out exactly what his life has meant to me and what w will mean to me in the future. And at the intersection, at the stop sign at Five Points and back Hamden Sydney Road, I just stopped. Put the truck in park. And I thought, it's really great that Walter is now whole in heaven. He can be like everyone else. And in a flash, my brain recoiled from that thought and I said, wait a minute. Just wait a minute. If God makes all perfect when they go to heaven, if you believe that He makes us a new creation indeed, I realized for the first time that if I am ever so blessed as to be there in heaven, there will be many, many souls, all of them there, who will be just like Walter. There was nothing wrong with Walter. He had it right. It's us who got it wrong. We have to remember what Walter taught us all. 
and live it forward. I give thanks to God that I have had Walter in my life. Amen. Brothers and sisters, as we are able, let us stand together and say what it is that we believe using the Apostles' Creed that is printed for us in our bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection in the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. O God, before whom all generations rise and flourish and then fall away, we praise you for all your servants who, having lived this life in faith and love and hope, now live eternally with you and the saints who have preceded us. Especially do we thank you this day for your very special and gentle creation, Walter Sims, whom some may have affectionately called Shorty, but who has truly been a biggie in the hearts of this community. We praise you and thank you for our blessed memory of his parents, Gil and Julia, and for the loving choices they made for their son's life. And we also honor and thank you for the tender ways that Walter's older brother, Scott, has fulfilled his parents' wishes for their younger son. And we thank you for all those loved ones, many here this day, who have faithfully stood beside and walked with both of these Sims brothers through the years. And we also pray for all those parents and families who are living with and loving similar ones of your children. And we pray that they also may have surrounding communities like this one to help them with love and prayer. We thank you for the long-time gift of Walter Sims' gracious and memorable life and for the untold hundreds of village residents and college alumni who have learned so many lifetime lessons from this big little man who in scriptural words truly knew no guile, and who brimmed full of such open love and personal integrity for all of us. In the 242 years of this college's blessed life, only one professor and coach has taught us with Down syndrome. And we thank you that we have been in that classroom and on that athletic field. We thank you that for Walter, his latter-day discomforts and death are now past, and that what some people may have termed his limitations are now completely removed in the perfect fullness of your eternal kingdom where there are joyful reunions prepared and promised 
for all those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And whatever the particular forms of consciousness that may continue with the saints, we know there is surely happiness that this very instant there is a family's heavenly huddle of Walter and Gil and Julia and Uncle Walter's nephew Brad. And we thank you for our New Jersey friend, Michael Furneau, who has taken our community and family secret and told it to the world. And from this family's friends in this college community who have learned so many lessons from Walter Sims' lifetime and love time among us, we whisper as our corporate eulogy the final words that friend Horatio whispered to friend Hamlet. Good night, sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. And will all of you join me as we lift our prayers in the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to say in the sure and certain knowledge that God's love completely takes care of everyone. And you can say debts or trespasses, either one, God's love can take care of either. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The hymn is hymn number 338. You probably know the words anyway. Kumbaya, one verse. wondering why we are singing Kumbaya, it was the hymn Walter suggested for his father's funeral, and he loved it, so we sang it today, and I hope he gave a big cheer at the end of that. Prior to the blessing and benediction, let me invite you all to please remain standing after the benediction as the family exits the sanctuary. And in all, they go to Snyder Hall at Gam and Jim, where they invite you all to join them for food and fellowship and lots of remembering and stories. They shall be thick and flying, I am sure. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's own Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you today, tomorrow, and forevermore. Now, Lord, let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. Amen.